From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Good evening and welcome to the special edition of Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Edgardo Lasoya. Tonight we celebrate some of our top reports from our Cronkite Sports Bureau, from the efforts to keep athletes healthy to stories of inspirational athletes who are transforming communities. Fewer kids are playing Pop Warner football these days, and that could do with the safety concerns or the prices. But either way, the decline in participation of youth football is not expected to drop. Cronkite sports reporter Anthony Totry found out how one Pop Warner league is dealing with it. There you go, there you go. Far West Pop Warner in the West Valley said they typically field 15 to 20 teams. This season, they only have enough players for 11 squads. We try to be as safe as we can. I mean, you know, we've been around 90 years for a reason. You know, we're always in the forefront of trying to do things right, especially in this time of day and age. You know, our sport is under is under fire. According to the Sports and Industry Fitness Association, there's been a nearly 5% drop year over year nationwide in the number of kids ages 6 to 17 playing tackle football. Less participants means less money coming in, which makes it difficult to pay for all the necessary aspects of youth football. Fields cost a ton of money. They're very expensive, and if you have them at night, you're paying for not just the fee of the field, but now you're paying for the lights of the field as well. For years, Far West Pop Warner has rented out two full fields here outside State Farm Stadium for both practices and games. However, this is the first season that they will only use these fields for practices, and that's because the rental price is equivalent to registration for roughly 30 to 40 kids. Those youth fields were costing us upwards of 10,000 every year. Aside from fields, the $300 average registration fee per person also goes toward insurance, referees, lights, and a handful of other essentials. Far West Steelers coach and parent Vince Del Ponte believes that Pop Warner's rule book takes the necessary steps toward keeping kids safe. Safety is not an issue, you know, um, and that goes back to the rules with Pop Warner. Because of these rules, we're not going to do some of the stuff that's going to get the other kids injured. Despite youth football leagues making an effort to implement safer rules, the SFIA projects that participation in youth football will continue to decline over the next five years. In Phoenix, Anthony Totry, Cronkite News. Rosen just left UCLA to pursue his career as a professional football player, but he could be headed back to Brentwood already this coming offseason. Cronkite News reporter Bailey O'Carroll explains. Arizona Cardinals quarterback Josh Rosen has chosen to go back to school. The 21-year-old was back in high school for a day at South Mountain in Phoenix for the Cardinals' partnership with Endeavor, a program that helps high school students explore possible careers in STEM. Having someone like Josh Rosen in a classroom is really helpful to get students excited for them to see that there's people in the community that are invested in their future. These are the skills that they need and um, uh, or the skills that they should be taught, and it's really awesome to see them being taught those skills. Only three years removed from high school himself, the now NFL QB said he was into math during his day at St. John Bosco High School in California. I know I didn't like to write a lot, so I definitely was more on the math side, and, and uh, um, this, is, this is right up my alley. But ironically, he chose his day back in a high school classroom to announce that he would be returning to the college classroom. I'm actually going to school this offseason. I have to need two more years to finish up, but uh, I'm really excited to go back and, and uh, start learning again, especially without football. Actually really study the material and try to like learn and not just pass tests and stay eligible. The former UCLA Bruin may be excited to return to the the classroom, but the Cardinals have nine more games left this season, and there's still a lot of work to be done on the field. Um, I'm more excited to finish this season, um, hopefully with a couple more wins. In Phoenix, Bailey O'Carroll, Cronkite News. Because the media plays such a significant role in sports, athletes have to stay aware at all times that people are watching. Our reporter, Sydney Carter, went to Grand Canyon University to learn more. Today's student athletes now not only have to worry about their performance in their sport, but how they appear away from the field of play as well. When you're an athlete, you're in the public eye a little bit more, so you have to be careful, you know, not only what you post, but how you present yourself just walking around campus because, you know, there's people who look up to you and are seeing what you're doing. I think with our student athletes, media is a huge component. There's a lot of times where they're interacting with various media sources throughout their collegiate career. Brianna Nagley teaches university success for student athletes at Grand Canyon University. 
She helps her students transition to college life, including how to responsibly manage both traditional media outlets and social media platforms. We do spend a significant amount of time working on how to build your brand, how to effectively communicate your message, and making sure that how the media receives it is how you ultimately want to be portrayed, because you're representing not only yourself, but your sport, your university, and your community. As a student athlete progresses in the career, the amount of eyes watching them only increases as they head into playing professional sports. I love what we do here at Grand Canyon University where we actually really prep our student athletes right when they get on campus about all the things that they're going to be exposed to. As soon as you do something, it could go viral. So I think what student athletes have to manage today is a lot more pressure, but hopefully we're helping our student athletes navigate that in a positive way. The course at Grand Canyon University was implemented in 2014 just one year after they became a Division I school. In Phoenix, Sydney Carter, Cronkite News. Even a state filled with cacti and sunshine has caught the hockey bug. Arizona has become one of the fastest growing youth hockey states in the country, and reporter Jake Tribolsky explains how. Arizona is not known for its freezing temperatures, but with youth hockey as popular as ever in the state, more desert kids are heading to the ice. My favorite part is shooting and stick handling. I like scoring goals. According to 2018 statistics from USA Hockey, registration for youth hockey in Arizona is up nearly 90% since 2013. It really is an emphasis that, that we go out there and grow the game. We are doing as much as we can to get youth involved in the sport. The state is filled with transplants who have brought the hockey fever with them. An Arizona native and 2016 top NHL draft choice, Austin Matthews has youngsters believing they too can make it to the league. But perhaps the biggest assist to the growth comes from the Arizona Coyotes. Along with flagship youth programs such as the Little Howlers, the team also sponsors local high school leagues, donates equipment, provides financial support to ice rinks, and has plans to introduce a street hockey PE curriculum to schools. You shouldn't be trying to get them to watch hockey, you should get them to play hockey. Because if you have a hockey player, you have almost a guaranteed hockey fan. It's not about selling tickets, it's about investing into your community and, and showing that you care about it. The team has also partnered with Arizona-born and 2014 U.S. Women's Hockey Olympian Lindsey Fry to create Small Fries, a hockey program designed specifically for girls. People are excited about this, they see the value in it, and they see that, wow, we're, we're really growing the girls' hockey community from the bottom up, and that's something that's really special. Lindy Fry kept calling me smile, 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 smile. 56 young women graduated from the inaugural Small Fries program this summer, adding to the growth of girls hockey in Arizona, something up 31% from a year ago, according to USA Hockey. In Glendale, Jake Trybolski, Cronkite News. The Arizona Department of Gaming is bringing back its state boxing championship and adding a new state MMA championship. Our own Ethan Gaines has more on how these new titles could affect combat sports in Arizona. It's been 16 years since Arizona had a state-sanctioned boxing title, but last month the Arizona Boxing and Mixed Martial Arts Commission announced that it would once again recognize a state boxing championship belt as well as creating a brand new MMA title. I stumbled upon the, the rule that we had for state championships and I began to look and see when's the last time we had one. And I thought that we could re-energize and help the industry by giving some excitement to promoters by having a new thing to compete for. Arizona has four local MMA promoters and two for boxing and is now one of just a handful of states with an MMA championship. It's been necessary. Probably two-thirds of the events we do are now MMA events. The fan base is growing daily, I think. They're very well-attended events, and it's the high time we had a state champion, I think. Many local boxers are excited about the reinstatement of the state boxing titles, including Fidel Hernandez, a light heavyweight boxer who won the state championship back in 1997. I was young. I was 18 years old. I had just been a professional for one year. Just to have a belt it means a lot to a fighter, especially when you're starting off. There's a lot of great fighters that won state titles before becoming world champions, so it means a lot. Manessas added that he's excited to put the titles up for grabs in the near future. Us having more, more titles um, will help promoters um, feel more, sell more seats, so that'll help them. The financial impact for our economy here in the state of Arizona um, is expected to help the more events that we have 
that draws more crowds, greatly affects the economy here in Arizona and affects the revenue for the promoters. The new championships will be active in every weight class. From Phoenix, Ethan Gaines, Cronkite News. Artificial intelligence is finding its way into, well, just about every aspect of everyday life. And now a team working with ASU's Fulton School of Engineering is planning on making it a part of athletes' daily routine. Bailey O'Carroll takes us inside the lab. Artificial intelligence, data analysis, plus athletes. An equation that could quite possibly eliminate many injury issues in sports. Artificial intelligence systems, okay. in a sense that how to enable uh, an intelligent agent to perceive its surrounding world, uh, make sense out of it, right. and be able to make decisions in a much more informed fashion. Yijo Young and his team want to revolutionize injury prevention through tracking athletes' movements. The technology is out there, but it's only available to athletes on the pro level or to those willing to shell out a fair amount of cash. This technology isn't normally tapped into until an athlete becomes a pro. By that point, their muscle memory is locked in. If you were to have a high school pitcher, and if you can afford our technology, which is essentially just a one camera, and then you record your mo motion movement and you upload it, we can feedback to you whether you should focus more on this like fine grain movement or be careful with your wrist in this certain motion that you should want to avoid that can prevent your um, uh, future injuries. The guys are hoping to use cameras just like this one to prevent sports injuries in the future. We want to fully utilize uh, camera as the single um, channel of sensory inputs to essentially evaluate the human performance. Next, they analyze the movement data the camera records. We don't need huge machines to process data and with the hope at the end, apply these technologies onto commercial products, such as maybe cell phones. The key will be making their technology cell phone friendly. Young isn't sure when the technology will be ready to use on a cell phone, but when it does happen, it'll be a game changer we can essentially, from, from a bottom-up manner, uh, change the uh, uh, landscape of sports. In Tempe, Bailey O'Carroll, Cronkite News. Arizona State is known to be innovative, even in the sports facilities. Cronkite News reporter Taylor Rocha explains how Arizona universities use a business intelligence program to help raise funds. The Pac-12 has been dubbed the Conference of Champions, not only for their athletic performance, but for their forward-thinking nature in the business space. When Arizona State University began renovations of Sun Devil Stadium in 2014, the athletic department tried to figure out things like ticket pricing, concessions, and perhaps most important, ways to maximize fundraising efforts for the project. ASU turned to mountains of data to find answers. The problem, there was just too much of that data and no easy way to pour through it. We, along with USC, were two of the schools that already had um, data warehouses, essentially, where we, stole, we stored all of our fan data. The problem with it is you couldn't really work with it or manipulate it or have visuals of it. The Pac-12 answered with Domo, a Utah-based business intelligence program that gives universities tools to understand what the numbers mean. ASU was a pioneer of the program, which now extends to eight of the 12 Pac-12 schools, including the University of Arizona. The conference actually stood up and actually helped us create a way of taking on some of the costs and finding a way to help all 12 of the Pac-12 institutions. While schools in the Pac-12 compete on the field or court throughout the course of a season, this business technology highlights the collaborative nature of the Pac-12, as athletic departments are eager to share key practices with their counterparts. This strengthens the Pac-12 as a whole. Everyone's got problems. You know, there's no, there's not one school out here that's got the silver bullet that says, "Hey, we get we we have every answer to the book. We have seats to sell, um, we have dollars to fundraise for, and um, everything that we're doing is is ultimately kind of pointing in that direction." <laughs> Both Arizona universities said they are only scratching the tip of the iceberg in their utilization of DOMO. The ultimate goal with all of these decisions, increasing revenue for the schools. DOMO's impact expands further than the dozen individual universities. The Pac-12 uses this technology to boost ticket sales as they look to fill seats for the Pac-12 football championship game 
and the Pac-12 men and women's basketball tournaments. In the Broadcast Center, I'm Taylor Rocha, Cronkite News. When the ASU men's tennis team was newly reinstated after a 10-year hiatus, head coach Matt Hill called the team a, quote, blank canvas. Two years later, that very canvas is filled with diversity. Our Colette Stein caught up with the team in Tempe at the Whiteman Tennis Center. Nine athletes from nine different locations around the world. After being discontinued 10 years ago, ASU came back with an entirely new team and coaching staff just last year. We were coming in kind of late on the recruiting side of things and also with really, really high expectations as a group. So we were, we were looking for the best players from each nation, each country that we spoke to. And that's really kind of what we ended up doing is the, the guys that are on the team now, they, they are the best player coming into college tennis from their respective countries for the most part. So, um, yeah, it's a really high level group and it's been a fun, a fun process so far. Italy, Germany, the Dominican Republic, these are all places that athletes on the ASU men's tennis team call home. But despite their cultural differences, they're still able to come together as a family. It's a lot of culture and I think it's, uh, that's good for the team because a lot of culture, but we all like, give each other what's the best from our culture and it makes like, the team like, special. Like, uh, I know we, we, we hang out a lot like, every time and we are we're still like, good friends like, on the court, especially off the court. I think it's the, the best opportunity of my whole life to be here and uh, of course represent a great team as ASU after 10 years. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's special for sure. The ASU men's tennis team will kick off this coming season in January. In Tempe, Colette Stein, Cronkite News. It's been seven months since renovations started at ISM Raceway in Avondale. But this past weekend, race fans in Arizona were the first to be able to enjoy the multi-million dollar project themselves for the Can-Am 500 semifinal race. Ricardo Avila takes us on a tour. The day finally came. The curtain on the $178 million renovation project at ISM Raceway lifted. An extreme makeover that includes several new features that are intended to make fans an essential part of the action. The whole thing, it's just everything's brand new. It's just, it's, it's just, I don't know, my jaw's been down here all, all week, all weekend. So Phoenix is my favorite. Um, I've been to Bristol and Vegas. And, California, but Phoenix has always been my favorite. The infield experience allows fans to get into the garages and closer to the drivers and their teams. Just ask Sheila Finley, who came in from Canada just for the race. They've done an awesome job. It's really nice. I can't compare it to what it was before, but they've, it's awesome compared to the other tracks like me now. Oh, it's right up near the top. So far, so good. Like, uh, they've done a great job here. Great job. As you can see, I'm currently surrounded by hundreds of race fans who are very excited about the last race of opening weekend here at the renovated ISM Raceway. Fans can purchase one of these bad boys, a hot pass for $129, getting them access to be up and close to the drivers in the garages and being closer to the action. This is the biggest renovation in ISM Raceway's history. New features like a pedestrian tunnel that connects the infield to the grandstands made of reused parts of the old bleachers literally connects past and present. It's pretty impressive. We've been coming out here for several years now and uh, it's definitely a step up. I've been to Vegas, Daytona, and, and they're definitely uh, stepping up to the plate. You gotta come and see it, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. That's all I can say. You only get one chance to make a first impression and judging by fan reaction, the ISM Raceway in Avondale nailed it. Grand Canyon University's eSports program is on the rise. Their varsity Overwatch team made it to the Sweet 16 last year and the school just opened a brand new eSports arena. Our own Ethan Gaines takes a look at what GCU is doing to make some noise in the college esports scene. Justin Johns is the president of the fastest growing club at Grand Canyon University, the esports team. The senior computer science major is also the captain of the varsity Overwatch squad, and he's seen the esports program grow into the second largest club on campus in just a few years. We are all just a couple of guys on laptops in a room. We didn't have any support from the university other than just giving like general club funds and a space to be. Since then, we moved up from a 15 computer arena to now a 36 computer arena. It shows that they want to keep their standards high though, and we've been competing pretty top tier since. College esports is on the rise all across the country, with over 100 schools supporting varsity teams, according to the National Association of Collegiate Esports. In an effort to compete on the national stage, 
GCU just opened its brand new esports arena in August, and the school invested tens of thousands of dollars into new equipment, according to GCU esports coordinator Albert Lee. GCU provides so much support for esports teams as well as the esports community. In just my short time here, they've provided not just the esports arena with 36 high end computers and gaming consoles, but the varsity and junior varsity teams now have a bigger and better place to practice as well as play competitively against other colleges. John said that GCU may be adding scholarships for esports as soon as next year in an effort to continue growing the program. In Phoenix, Ethan Gaines. We're ready, we're ready. Cronkite News. The Seattle Storm is standing tall as the WNBA champions after a three-game sweep of the Washington Mystics. But now, some Phoenix Mercury players are also being featured on the virtual hardwood. Justin Palm reports on how the gaming industry is helping build the brand. For the second time in history, WNBA superstars like Diana Taurasi and Brittany Griner will be featured in NBA Live, a basketball video game. Young girls playing uh, a lot of video games too, so it'd be nice if... You know, I can pick Stewie. Um, would have been nice when I was younger to, to be Cheryl Swoops. I think it's kind of cool. According to Forbes, the WNBA saw a 36% increase in viewership from last season, with growth on the rise for the WNBA for the first time ever NBA Live is allowing gamers to create female players. You know, to have that for, for a women's player gives a lot of young girls and even young, young boys, you know, an opportunity to, to kind of see the other side of things and see how the WNBA is and um, have something to aspire to. Representation, especially for younger kids, um, is really big. Just to be able to see yourself in those positions and see yourself in those roles and like look at it like, oh, I can do this. Um, I think it's extremely important, and especially awesome to have it in, in video games to be able to play yourself. Um, I think that's a huge step for us. Even though the addition of WNBA players in video games may be good for the league, many of the players aren't concerned about playing them. They're just focused on playing basketball. I was never a gamer, but um, again, I can see the, the importance of um, just having that embed in our culture, you know, starting at a young age. You know, it means something, I think, when um, those narratives are, are such where people can see women being successful. It, it definitely means something. Now that WNBA players are in video games, fans can make Brittany Griner's comments about beating DeMarcus Cousins one-on-one -on -one a reality. In Phoenix, Justin Parm, Cronkite News. Arizona Cardinals wide receiver Larry Fitzgerald picked up the bill for patrons of Casella's Deli yesterday for five hours. It was a way to support the deli's owner, Joe Casella, who has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Reporter Taylor Rocha has a story. 11 years after Saguaro High School's opening in 1966, Casella's Italian Deli opened their doors right around the corner. Quickly, this restaurant would become a staple in the community. A relationship sprouted with owners Joe and Tina Casella and the Sabercats over four decades. They've been super supportive of the Saguaro community, and uh, they're just good people. They, they, they run a great place. It's, it's family food. It's, it's, uh, it's great food, and, and when you go in there, you're treated like your family. The community supported Joe Casella right back as the 79-year-old has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. To show support for Casella and his family, Larry Fitzgerald recently picked up the lunch tab at the deli. It means a lot to me and my family, not just me. He loves me and he loves my family. Anytime I say I, I want to change the I to we because it's family. It's just not about me. These family-focused values drew Fitzgerald to the deli and prompted him to aid Casella in his time of need. Despite the multitude of transplants in the valley, Fitzgerald stressed the importance of coming together to help a neighbor. This is a community of people from all around the country, but we really love the state of Arizona for the opportunities provided for us and the gifts it has given us. While Casella takes on his battle, his priority is to continue being a light in the Saguaro community. You're going to walk out of here smiling after I'm finished with you. And cheer on the Sabercats and the Cardinals along the way. In Scottsdale, Taylor Rocha, Cronkite News. And you may have noticed two other current Arizona Cardinals players there. Running back DJ Foster and rookie wide receiver Christian Kirk both graduated from Saguaro High School. 
Sports is often focused on the winners, but sometimes the people who finish last deserve their own spotlight. Taylor Rocha shares the story of the final athlete to cross the finish line at Ironman Arizona. After swimming 2.4 miles, this Ironman climbed out of the water feeling pain in her back, knowing that she still needed to bike 112 miles and run 26.2. On the bike, you don't feel it, but on the run, I was, I, I was hunched over. I couldn't stand up straight. And so every single um, aid station I stopped at, I just dropped to the floor. Sometimes it's not about when you finish, but how you finish. At midnight, 17 hours after the start of Ironman Arizona, there were still 100 people to cross through this finish line. 54 minutes after that, Ironman Arizona saw its final finisher, Joanne Shields, cross the finish line, becoming an Ironman for the 12th time. I had medical ask me several times, do we need to take you off the course? I'm like, no, I can keep going. I'm good. I'm, I can make it. There's no quit in me. Her can-do attitude is something that Shields prides herself in and something that she has taught her children, who are also Ironmen. Whenever you do these things, you can only control two things, your attitude and your effort. So if you give it 100% with a smile on your face, how can that be a bad day? Traditionally, the Ironman winner presents the final finisher with her medal. But as Shields crossed the finish line, her daughter received the honor. After swimming and biking and running for 17 hours, 19 minutes and 43 seconds, there was one thing on Shields' mind. Pizza, lots of it, pepperoni and mushrooms and olives and lots of salt. And after eating that meal, Shields says she already has her eyes on Ironman number 13. In Tempe, Taylor Rocha, Cronkite News. And Echo Janos and Heather Jackson were the men and women's champions at Ironman Arizona. Janos finished the race in 8 hours, 4 minutes, and Jackson in 8 hours and 39 minutes.